The year was 1882. The Orient Steam Navigation Company, better known as the Orient Line, had been successfully operating between the UK and Australia since 1877. Orient Line was directly competing with P&O for passengers travelling to and from Australia. By this point, they had custom-built two ships for their service, as well as purchasing a number of other ships from PSN Co. Orient Line was also working in partnership with PSN Co. to offer additional steamship services to Australia to meet the growing demand. Austral was the second steamship that Orient Line had built, entering service in May of 1882. On 11 November 1882, the ship was in the process of recoaling in Neutral Bay in Sydney Harbour, when she sank at the buoy. Tragically, several crew members were lost as a result of the sinking, though the majority were saved despite the ship sinking in the early hours of the morning. Orient Line management was shocked by the disaster. Their new ship was only in its second voyage to Australia. How did it sink? The newspapers were filled with reports, but the overall explanation remained largely the same. Austral's sinking was a story of human error. The ship was driven by steam engines fed from coal-fired boilers. When coal-powered ships needed refueling, they were taken to coaling stations such as the Neutral Bay Boy to begin the painstaking process of loading the heavy, dirty coal into the ship's coal bunkers. This meant that special ports were opened along the ship's side to enable workers to direct the fresh coal into the bunkers of the ship. This was a dangerous job and required great care to ensure the ship remained trimmed given how close to the waterline these coal ports were. On this day, during Austral's coaling process, the ship developed a list. This was put down to the coal being added to the starboard bunkers while the port side of the ship remained light due to the unloading of the ship's cargo that unexpectedly offset the trim. With the aft coaling ports having been left open while the coaling was occurring through the forward ports, as well as portholes being left open to ventilate the interior of the ship, the list meant that the ship quickly took on water and flooded. The 5,589 gross registered tonne ship settled in an upright position in about 40 to 50 feet of water, with masts and funnels still visible above the waterline. What a strange sight it must have been. The next thing the Orient Line wanted to know was, could the ship be saved? The answer to that question was yes, but it would be the largest engineering feat then undertaken in the Australian colonies, bearing in mind that this occurred before Australia even became a nation. Salvaging the Austral took more than three months, and it involved building a coffer dam from wood and canvas. A coffer dam is a watertight enclosure that allowed the water to be pumped out in a controlled manner. The ship was raised on the 1st of March 1883 at an estimated cost of 50,000 British pounds, which roughly equates to 7.7 .7 million pounds today, or more than 14 million Australian dollars. And of course, that was just the cost of the salvage. The ship still had to be fully repaired and cleaned before it could re-enter service. Considering the repairs and lost income from being out of service, the Austral sinking was a very costly exercise. It was widely reported in newspapers, both in Australia and across the British Empire, and noted as being the most significant salvage operation ever undertaken in the Australian colonies. Despite the disaster, the Orient Line recovered and continued to provide direct competition to P&O on the Australian route up until 1918 when P&O purchased a controlling interest in the line. Due to the line's popularity, P&O kept it as a separate entity, though from 1919, P&O and Orient Line worked in partnership with each other. The two officially merged in 1961, becoming P&O Orient for five years, before the Orient name was dropped and the company reverted to the name P&O. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. And if you're interested in finding out more about P&O and Orient Line's Australian heritage, let me know in the comments below. And until next time, keep those portholes closed, and I hope to see you on board.